Now, Scott Ratzan joins us me now joins me now for more on China's efforts to tackle COVID-19. Scott is the executive director of Business Partners to Convince. He's also editor in chief of the Journal of Health Communication International Perspectives. Great to have you with us, Scott. Thanks very much for your time. Now, talk to us about the significance of the new antibody drug in China. Well, thank you, Sally, for having me tonight and uh, around the world. It's really important that we begin to realize that we're not out of this pandemic yet, and we need all the arsenal that we can. We need to focus on vaccinating as many people as possible throughout the world and have appropriate treatments that are in place when people who are not vaccinated or those that are immunocompromised or don't have the benefit of vaccination have effective treatment. There are medicines, there are monoclonal antibodies, as you mentioned, and there are a lot of other things in the works that hopefully will be able to eventually get us to a phase where we can live with COVID and be in the post-pandemic era, but nonetheless have endemic COVID, as we call it. And China's working with a, it's, it's, it has its first mRNA vaccine. What's the status of that? Well, uh, I've been trying to follow what I could through the press uh, because, unfortunately, I say that as a, both a physician and a public health professional, the best way that we can actually decide if vaccines are ready are through the appropriate competent health authority, authorities. We have the WHO, World Health Organization, who's involved. We have national groups such as the U.S. FDA. We have regional groups such as the European Medicines Agency. And then, of course, in China and others. Uh, but what we end up have happening now because the pandemic has happened so quickly is many times we're having science by press release and this unfortunately i think gives us limited data on if the vaccine is ready if it's safe if it's effective and if it will have no side effects and that's why you know it's very difficult for me to comment other than what i have seen and read in the popular press which nonetheless does seem promising i mean nature mm. uh, reported on it and uh, other other groups have but we don't have enough data yet uh, to know for sure if this is going to be ready for millions or billions of people I understand. What's uh, you know, difficult as a general public, I suppose, is that every time it feels like the pandemic is over, a new variant comes about, like the new BA variants. What is the mm -hmm. biggest challenge for scientists in terms of trying to keep up with these variants to make sure the vaccines can inoculate people so that they're not going to once again get bowled over by a strong dose of a new COVID variant? Well, that's an excellent question, Sally. In reality, Unfortunately, we have what we've known about all viruses. All viruses, they end up mutating. So this was originally SARS-CoV-2, as we called it. And we know we've had a Delta variant, an Omicron variant, and these VAs are subvariants. And we could basically predict there will be more variants or subvariants. What we don't know is do the vaccines that we have today in our arsenal, are they ready to protect us against all of these variants? Fortunately, we do know that vaccines have kept people out of the hospital and kept people from dying. But a vaccine is only as good as vaccination. Vaccines are in vials. Vaccinations are in people's arms. So we have to do everything we can to get the safe and effective vaccines in people's arms and also have boosters as appropriate when new variants are coming forward that we've seen, you know, as we have in the last uh, couple of years since the pandemic began. Here we are in year three of this pandemic. There is every proof that the vaccines work, yet vaccine hesitancy is still rife across many parts of the world. In China, it's for the elderly populations. In Australia and the US, it's for all sorts of niche demographic populations. How do you get people to understand that vaccines work and just to have the jab? Well, absolutely. And what you mentioned before on what are some of the challenges, it's misinformation. We had vaccine hesitancy before COVID, at least it was identified by the World Health Organization as one of the top 10 threats. But we didn't have COVID and we didn't have an ongoing anti-vaccination movement that is so strong on social media. It is imperative of all of us as health professionals, as, as physicians, as media, to remind people that vaccines are the way out of this pandemic. We just ran a, a survey, we have now for three years in 23 countries, we published it in Nature uh, and Nature Communication. And what we said and what we show is that people are willing to take the vaccine. Actually, China is the highest of the 23 countries in the world that we, we polled. But what's happening is, is that some people might be called hesitant, but they're really not hesitant. 
they just need to be activated. They just need to hear from their doctor. They just have to make it easy from their workplace. And that's why, as you mentioned, even business partners to convince. We work with employers to make it easier that people can return to work and also get the vaccine so they know they're at a safe and uh, fun mm -hmm. or easy uh, workplace to be able to get their vaccines. And just briefly, even though it's a big issue, so it's hard to be brief, let's talk momentarily about vaccine equality. I read a, a remarkable statistic. 80% of the developed world has had at least one jab, while 18% of the developing world has had at least one a jab. How do we get these vaccines, especially these more effective NRNA vaccines, to the countries that need it most? Well, I think it's a very important question, and we've been all about vaccine equity around the world. We have tried to create the institutions with the World Health Organization, with the Center for uh, Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, with a variety of groups to try to come up with ways of getting vaccines to people. But the mRNA vaccines originally had to be kept at a much lower temperature, which means we didn't need normal cold, cold chain with refrigerators and ice, but we needed a very effective cold chain. It seems like the new Chinese vaccine that you mentioned before actually doesn't need as much of a cold chain. So if we're able to limit some of the challenges of supply and delivery, we're more likely to actually, again, get these vaccines into countries that need it and into people's arms and to overcome uh, some of the challenges that we faced, including hesitancy and in those that don't want, shall we say, the first generation vaccine and they want an mRNA RNA vaccine. Scott Rattan, thanks so much for your insight and your time. Scott Rattan there for us. Thanks for having me, Sol. A closer look at the